now it's the rest stop with Brad Restituto. Comes up to the pocket, fires the right side, caught by Diggs. Stay up! Oh my God! Oh my God! Welcome to the rest stop on this Thursday, September 3rd. We are live here in Las Vegas and we come to you every Tuesday and Thursday live on twitch.tv slash Chris Landry football. Also live on Brad Restituto Facebook page and on Periscope, our Twitter page at Brad the Believer. So thanks for tuning in for another show. We got a good one for you today. We're going to come with you at another segment, a new segment called In Case You Missed It. Uh, We'll give some commentary on some videos in the pop culture world, in the reality TV world, and we'll give some thoughts about that, give you a little bit of entertainment there. And, of course, we're going to talk some sports today also. We're going to give you some highlights uh, from the NBA. Huge, huge move in news in the NBA today in the coaching carousel. We'll get into that. LeBron James decided to make some noise on the Twitter verse today also during the playoffs, something he's not accustomed to doing, some Kirk Cousins tweet and information on the pandemic some nfl news also to get to before the kickoff of the nfl season which is less than two weeks away Uh, but to start off tonight a little update on if in case you missed uh this isn't the segment but in case you missed our last show on tuesday uh, i had a i have a fractured foot which i fractured last friday playing basketball and it has not looked good as i've tried to um, maneuver my way around my apartment. I've got crutches. I've got a knee scooter, but I'm feeling I'm feeling good today. I feel I feel like the road to recovery is in sight, and I say that because I could put zero pressure on my foot the first few days, and not that I'm putting any pressure on it because I know my mom's listening and she's going to be giving me a hard time through text left and right after this statement that I'm about to make. But um, I am um, I am able to limp a little bit around the apartment, um, not putting pressure on it, but I'm able to limp around and, and it makes me feel like the recovery is in sight. So I'm excited about that. And also since I'm pretty much incapacitated in the most part, AK checking in. What's up, Adam Joseph from Opportunity Village. What's up? Thanks for checking in. Hopefully you stick around for a little bit. We got some entertaining stuff coming up here in just about five minutes. Um, but yes, I, I'm maneuvering with my fractured foot and I'm still on my Netflix uh, binge here because I don't have much to do. Uh, so I started off season one of Ozark. And I know anybody that's clicked into Netflix has heard about it, and I'm probably very late to the party, but I've been late to the party on other stuff. I'm about four episodes in, and Ozark's awesome. And what's the the most impressive part to me is Jason Bateman. This guy has been an actor, uh, a prominent actor, television, movies, definitely since the 80s, and he is just doing a phenomenal job. He's part director and lead actor in Ozark. And through four episodes, Jason Bateman is absolutely hitting a home run. So I'm excited. After the show tonight, I'll get back into that a little bit. So I'm moving along better with my fractured foot. I feel like the road to recovery will be good. I'll be re-X-rayed in about eight weeks. So that's the update there. Uh, And some sad news in the pop culture Twitter universe and uh, my main man, Spencer the Wiz, will be able to chime in on this. Taco Bell is in the news again as they are continuing to cut their menu. They decided today that they're going to get rid of the Mexican pizza and the taco salad, Spence, and they're getting a lot of backlash already if, they t- if they've taken some values off the menu. They continue to cut costs today with this news. Taco Bell getting a lot of backlash. No Mexican pizza. That's a thumbs down for me. No taco salad. That hits homes for you and your family, Spence. Taco Bell, what's going on with them, man? Yeah, my parents are very upset. Uh, I, I wouldn't have noticed. I don't usually get that. And I'm also trying to stay away from fast food currently. But I will say uh, it is quite the controversy in the household. There has actually been a, a ban in the household for my parents of Taco Bell. No longer allowed to have it in the house. So, Yeah, so there you have it. So we're going to get right into it. Hopefully, uh, Adam Joseph still tuned in because this segment is a brand new one. It's called 
in case you missed it, and we're going to start off talking in case you missed it. There's been a lot of people locked down since this pandemic, uh, but one fellow who hasn't been locked down or deterred, we'll talk about. Spence, hit the opener. Yeah, it's rewind time. Okay, so starting off in case you missed it, coming up first is George the Bulldog, okay? And you want to say, well, why am I talking about a Bulldog? Because this is a sports show, but mixed with pop culture, and George the Bulldog does a little bit of both. During this pandemic, it doesn't matter. It hasn't deterred him. Spence, show us George the Bulldog right now. You ask what's special about George the Bulldog? He's a skateboarder. Look at him go. No fear from George the Bulldog. So sometimes people ask, uh, do pigs fly? Or they'll see this when pigs fly. When are you going to see a bulldog as pretty much a professional skateboarder? Spence, you can find George the Bulldog at georgeskates.com or his Instagram, Skater K9. And that video is courtesy of Nadine and Marcus Single. Thank you very much. They're the owners of George the Bulldog. And that's just a little clip of what he can do. Spence, this bulldog, he's gnarly, man. He is not only a smart and navigating skateboarder, he loves to do it, and he's really good. I mean, what are your thoughts there? I mean, the, the pandemic is not slowing him down. If we're ever without sports again, we're going to start a dog sporting league, and, and George is going to be the, the face. I'm going to be his agent, working that out. I'm certainly, yeah, I'm certainly not opposed. The thing that impresses me the most is his ability to balance his little paws and navigate it to go left and right. You can see, to me, that's the most impressive part, along with being able to go down the ramp, obviously, and use his teeth to utilize turning the board. But he's able to go left and right. Like, you could tell he could move around, like, where he wanted. It wasn't a random occurrence, or at least it didn't seem so. So in talking with his owner, Marcus Single, Dr. Single, who is my podiatrist, he's looking after my broken foot also. Uh, but he's telling me George absolutely lo he loves skateboarding. He wants to do it all the time. And he's good. So he's been practicing for years. He's experienced. Um, and, and that's just a little clip. This guy, as a bulldog, he just gets on that board. He uses his mouth, throws it up, and then jumps on it. Like you said, navigates his way around. So Dr. Single told me he just got a, uh, a drone, which is going to help the camera views of getting George and, and Dr. Single's also new bulldog named Walter, who's one years old. It's not quite the skateboarder George is. Uh, but George, he's intense. Not only can he skateboard, though, he can, like, wakeboard, surfboard. I mean, he just loves it. So definitely check out his Instagram page. He's got way more followers than I do, over 24,000 followers on Instagram, and he's super talented. And once we get uh, people back in score sporting events, I'm going to see if I can become George the Skateboarding Bulldog's agent because I've got some ideas. I'm not going to give them out live on there, but I got, so, I got some plans for George in the future. So that's why I wanted to bring him on to this segment today, talk a little bit about him, because you may see more of him in the future. I'm going to see if I can be a part of that. So I think you need a law degree to be an agent, no matter what it is, though, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, okay, Spence. Now, you, now we're playing semantics here, okay? You're going to tell me how and how I can't be an agent. All I need to do is facilitate uh, a meeting with people that put on halftime shows, okay? And then I can negotiate what I want to happen from there. So, okay, you don't, you can't tell me in your law linguistics that I have to have a law degree to, to be an agent for an animal. There's okay, two, I think you're talking about being a manager, which is, which is, I think you're, you're leaning more towards the managerial side where you okay, kind of maybe said, so, maybe so. Maybe, thank you for the correction. Yes. Maybe the managerial side of George, the skating bulldog. So we'll have to revisit that conversation once we're able to get more fans in participation of live sporting events. Uh, this, the second multiple clip, multiple clips of video I want to get to over the last month, I've really gotten into this reality TV show. It's called alone in the wilderness for a million dollars. You have to spend a hundred days 
in the Arctic, the, the Canadian wilderness. There's 10 participants, okay, and they have to survive for 100 days. And if you last 100 days out in the Canadian wilderness, you win $1 million. And, of course, you're allowed, I believe, 10 supplies as you get in there. But it's pretty much you're on your own. All the filming is done by each individual as they're given camera equipment. They have to hunt for their own. And as the season changes, it goes pretty much from early fall into winter. So in the beginning of the 100 days, the weather's manageable. But as they move along, it gets ice cold and, and absolutely brutal conditions. And Spence, I want to start it off. We're almost in day 75 when we showed this first clip. And there's three participants left at this point, all vying for a million dollars. There's a, a girl named Kaylin. And, and, and the two we're focusing on today, and then Roland. So let's get to the first clip. And Kaylin, around day 75, in her quest for $1 million to last 100 days in the Canadian Arctic. Yes, 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 come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah, And that, that was Kylan. And if you were able to see that clip, uh, it was absolutely brutally cold. You could see the snow all on the ground. And Kylan was going ice fishing for her meal around day 75. And she caught a fish, a trout. And she absolutely was in bliss after that moment of her catching the trout and, and some great momentum there on day 75. Spence, let's get to clip two. <laughs> Uh, don't turn your dials. If you're just joining us, we're breaking down reality TV show Alone in the Arctic, 100 Days for a Million Dollars. What you just saw there was one of the last three participants. His name was Roland. And during this expedition on about day 76 uh, or so, Roland killed an 800-pound musk ox in the Canadian wilderness, broke down its parts, brought them back to his camp. And that was him uh, enjoying part of the musk ox there on day 76. So what we're breaking down here is 100 days in the Canadian Arctic alone is the name of the reality show. And we're focusing on two contestants here going down to the final stretch for a million dollars. Kylan and Roland Spence hit clip number three. So that was Kylan again, Spence, as she again was attempting to catch a fish in the Arctic going uh, ice fishing. She had a fish on the line and lost it. And she lost, she lost not only the fish, she started to lose it herself after losing that fish. As you can see her crying and just wailing there. So my question is, 100 days in the Canadian wilderness, in the Arctic, she's on day 76, 77. And I mean, is it okay to pretty much lose your marbles in your mind after that long in solitude and in the wilderness surviving on the land? Can we really excuse any kind of behavior at that point, Spence? Yeah, I think it all comes into relative importance. So like in real, let's say she was in the real world, I would say you would have a similar reaction to getting fired from a really important job or something like that. And in that moment in day 76, survival is the only important thing. So when it comes down to you eating or not eating at that night, 
you missing that fish is the equivalent to losing everything that you hold precious to you. So yeah, I, I would say it's pretty justified at that point. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that, look, I I've talked to you personally uh, about my ability to build and kind of my technological aspect, although you don't really have to know technology to survive in the wilderness, but building, I mean, it's an accomplishment for me to set up a PlayStation for, so for me to build my own shelter, start my own fire, not only hunt and kill and catch something, but to open it up, break it down efficiently and cook it. Uh, I'd be a mess. I, I would only be able to go as far as I could fast and survive on water and maybe tree branches because uh, my ability to hunt and kill something, it's going to be almost next to nothing. I went on one camping trip as uh, a kid, like a, a 10 or 11 years old in Florida. And it was one of the worst experiences of my life. It was freezing cold, like the coldest night in, in Orlando history. Couldn't start a fire. I had a, a kid with me that was panicking and making it worse. I could do nothing. And that was the first and last time I've ever been camping. Uh, so as enticing and as strong-minded as I'd like to think I am surviving in the wilderness, um, unless I went through months of training and by getting trained by a survivalist or somebody that absolutely knew what they were doing, uh, if you just threw me out there, even in my best shape, full health, uh, I still, without training, I'm in trouble. I'm in a lot of trouble. And I give myself two weeks, two weeks. And I don't think I'd ta tap out though, Spence. I would not tap out. I would suffer until I pretty much, they had to drag me out of their debt. I try to survive a lot. I, I feel like I have the mental fortitude to survive the isolation and the starvation uh, but my body would eventually shut down. I wouldn't tap out, but they'd have to drag me out of there at some point because I would have no energy to do anything. Well, the problem, I think, from the way the show is set up is that you have to quit. Because I don't think they, from what I understood, they can't monitor you or maybe they may check in with you at the end of the day or something like that. But I don't know. I, I don't exactly understand. But personally, I would have to train at least. Like I know basic survivor skills, but not to the level of, hey, you have literally nothing and you have to create everything. I can survive like, oh, you have these amount of supplies and you have to survive that many days. But oh, it's different than that in this show, obviously. Yeah. If you're just joining us, we're breaking down the reality show alone. And in the, in the, and alone, you're, you're in the Canadian wilderness in the Arctic and you have to survive 100 days. And if you survive 100 days, you get $1 million. We're down to our final two, Kylan and Roland. And the and Brian Bravo, thanks for checking in, my man. Stick with us here. Roland is is the ultimate survivalist, and he's sticking around. Hit that last clip, Spence. Roland. And Roland was the eventual winner of a loan in the wilderness Arctic of Canada for $1 million. And he earned every bit of that Spence as along the way, he clubbed porcupines. He killed 800 pound musk ox. He built amazing shelters along the way. And he persevered through it all. And of course he chalked up the victory. His mother had passed away uh, before he started the show. But he made it all the way to 100 days, collected the $1 million, and was the ultimate survivalist. This guy thrived in that environment and talked about growing up uh, in a family that was survivalist and, and talked a lot about surviving on the land and wilderness and learning some of those skills. And he was outstanding through the entirety of the show and ended up lasting the 100 days, Spence. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, it's it's absolutely insane. Um it takes it definitely takes like a really special person uh to be able to do that uh the, the thing is is we've talked about this too personally like you can't learn to just do this you have to 
like be born with it if that makes sense i don't know if that's physically possible but it has to be in order for this to make sense so uh this guy you know from a very young age was interested in doing that and he just went full on you could tell that he was into it too like like he was struggling to survive yes but it was something he was excited about it was something to challenge it he was excited to take on versus hey you just got dropped out here hopefully you can survive 100 days uh look and, and anybody out there listening uh, give us your comments how long could you last out in the wilderness could you last 10 days 20 days 100 days if you're just joining us thank you for joining us we're live every tuesday and thursday nine to ten o'clock pacific time and this is the rest stop and be sure even if you're on facebook you can download the twitch app for free download twitch go to twitch.tv slash chris landry football and you can find the rest stop there live and listen and comment there we're on facebook live periscope live and if you miss any part of the show please Go to any of the podcast platforms, iTunes, Spotify, Audio Boom, and search Chris Landry Football Conference Call. And then when you look under Landry Football Conference Call, search the rest stop, and you'll pull us up right there. So, Spence, also in case you missed it, Kirk Cousins, Minnesota Vikings quarterback, he was in the news this week because of a podcast he was on with NFL Network's Kyle Brandt talking about COVID-19 and does the virus give him a lot of fear? And he made a comment on a scale of one to 10, his fear level is about 0.01. So we got a little bit of backlash from that. Uh, but if you really put it into perspective, he was just talking about not going out mask free and, and just living carefree. He was still abiding by all the rules that are asked of us by the CDC, the social distancing, wearing a mask. He's just talking about his fear level was not very high. I'm not going to I'm not going to give him a lot of flack for that, Spence, because some of us are in that same boat where on a scale of not having any fear on one side and then having so much fear where you're going to lock yourself in a bathroom, um I think it's okay. Yes, Brian, bravo checking in. Yes, be respectful, but I don't think the guy should be chastised for giving his opinion if he's still following the rules that are asked of him doing social distancing, wearing a mask. But if in the comfort of his own home, he is not living in fear, like a lot of us aren't living in fear. I mean, look, I, I've gone out and played basketball quite a bit since this. Um, and he Cousins made the comment, if I die, I die. And that got a lot of backlash. But let's put it in perspective. I mean, he's pretty much saying we're, we're living with the fate of the choices that we make. Um so if he's doing the things he's supposed to do and it happens to him, he's okay with, with those consequences. And I agree with that because Spence, as we both know, we've decided to go out and play basketball at times during this pandemic. And that's something that we love and we're okay with the consequences because if we weren't, we wouldn't do it. Um, so I think that's all he's saying. I don't think it's anything to get up in arms about. Uh, did you hear these comments and do you have any opinion about it, Spencer? Yes. Yeah, so I, I totally understand where you're coming from. And I, I understand that completely. The problem where I think people are having an issue with it, when he says 0 0.01, I think he's mentioning the uh, the um, the death rate, which would be the opposite. Um, and with by saying that, he's saying he's minimizing the amount of people who have died already, I think is where he, he just worded it very uh, strangely. Like, you know, relatively speaking, you, you know, where I'm coming from. Yeah. Uh, so do I technically think that, yes, he he's not coming from a, a wrong place by saying we should live every second in fear? No. But again, if you're if you can't minimize hundreds of thousands of deaths, it's just it's too much, to be honest with you. And a lot of them probably could have been avoided. Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't feel or catch that he was minimizing the deaths of others. I, I thought he was referring to. um on the level of fear he has personally, but I, I don't think he was minimizing the deaths. And I know in this conversation at, at times, uh, people can get that misconstrued uh, people minimizing deaths. I know I had a conversation about whether we should start football. And if one person died from it, should the entire thing be shut down? And it sounds like I'm minimizing that one death, but I'm, I'm trying to put in context that every time you do something, there's risk involved. And are, why don't we talk about the fact that every offseason in spring football, there is a catastrophic, catastrophic event that happens in some of these spring practices. We've seen guys die from overexertion, heat stroke every year. 
And we, we don't emphasize that too much. It, it's not something that gets a talking point every day. There's risk in everything, Spence, is what I'm saying. And, and I'm not saying that we should minimize any of the health risks involved in COVID. But I think if we do our part as individuals and we are getting tested, we're social distancing, and we're being careful, um, that, then we're doing what's asked of us. I don't, I don't think it's necessary to not be able to try and put forth normality especially in our everyday lives, whether I mean, there, there's people going to work every day in grocery stores and hospitals. So what's the difference in them going to work? And when you go to work, they're not getting tested every day. I, I worked at a grocery store and I was, I was got my temperature taken, but I wasn't tested every day, at least with these pro sports and football, they will get tested frequently. So there's that safety aspect involved. And if somebody gets it, they immediately get put into quarantine and away from everybody else. So I don't see why uh, we have to be in such uh, fear on the consequences of COVID where we can't even attempt to put out college sports and college football. That being said, we did have some college football tonight and we had a couple games going on and one is just finishing up Southern Alabama against Southern Miss. And Southern Miss, I believe, was a big underdog, and, and they stayed close in that game. And then also UAB, Alabama, Burning, Birmingham, I believe, took on Central Arkansas. Uh, UAB was a big favorite, and they won that game, uh, but they did not cover the spread. So college football is back. And, look, Corey makes a good point as he's chiming in on Facebook. We talk about the brain injuries and the concussions, and that was a big talking point a couple years ago. He brought up Junior Seau. Junior Seau is pretty much – uh, far gone in the conversation. He's one of the, the greatest football players, defensive football players in NFL history. And somebody, I don't even think we've seen a documentary about his life. We've seen so many stories, uh, but we get little talk about Junior Seau these days. And he's one of the, if not the most prominent name ever to have that brain injury and, and deal with CTE. And, you know, it's, <laughs> this is something we talk about every now and then they're trying to adjust the rules, but why can't we seamlessly do the same thing with COVID? Why can't we seamlessly understand that we have testing in place? So many other professions have to go on with their everyday lives and st still continue to go to work. Uh, this is a job for a lot of people. So I don't see why we can't consider this a job also um, and continue to try to go about our daily lives in sports and in normal life with doing the proper things Safety wise, the safety measures with social distancing, with testing and, and with quarantining if somebody tests positive or they're not following the protocol asked uh, of their conference or their their football team. So uh, that's my thought on that. Uh, some more in the news of Twitter. LeBron James decided that in his playoff venture here in the bubble, he was going to be involved in social media as in the past. Uh, LeBron James has shut down social media during playoff time, but this is an election year. This is 2020. This is civil unrest. LeBron James has decided I will get on Twitter. And he replied to a tweet today initially by Richard Jefferson talking about Giannis Antetokounmpo was similar to Scottie Pippen in being a 1-1-A. And then Jay Williams of ESPN, former Duke superstar basketball player, commented in saying LeBron James at one time uh, was a sidekick to Dwayne Wade in Miami. And LeBron James uh, got on Twitter and said, explain to me why the F, what the F I got to do with this subject matter. I'm over here minding my business, preparing for Houston. And by the way, I never been nobody but my damn self. Shit. So LeBron James has decided he uh, was going to not be locked down from social media during this playoff uh, expedition, and he decided to get fired up. So he's saying he's trying to prepare for Houston, but he's got enough time uh, in this bubble in Orlando with, you know, you can't blame him. He's not really going anywhere. He's does got more time on his hands, not spending time with his family. So he's on social media clapping back at Jay Williams uh, and a little fired up. I don't think that'll affect his play. Um, but I do think the Lakers will have their hands full with Houston just for the fact that uh, I believe Houston is going to put up between 45 and 63 point shots per game. Uh, and even if they hit 15 to 20 of those, I think that's going to far outnumber the amount of threes the Lakers are going to be able to hit. And the Lakers are going to have to shoot the ball really well in this series. Uh, Houston beat them twice 
in the regular season. I do think Houston's at a great disadvantage uh, from a rebounding perspective in this series, especially when P.J. Tucker at 6'5 is going to be your sender. They'll probably get blasted on the offensive boards with Anthony Davis, JaVale McGee, and Dwight Howard manning the middle for the L.A. Lakers. But the Lakers are going to have to shoot at least 30% from three, and they're going to have to make more free throws than they did last series because uh, if Harden even goes off a little bit and they do shoot in volume 63s per game and they make between 15 and 25, the Lakers could be in trouble. Spence, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I totally understand what you're saying. Uh, I just think the real issue comes in when you have – yeah, I mean, we're going to talk about the key matchups here, which is Anthony Davis is going to be guarded maybe partly by P.J. Tucker, and then you have a LeBron James who's going to be covered by, I don't know, Robert Covington, which is like kind of insane to think about. Uh, yes, Houston is going to shoot uh, a crazy amount of threes. Like, we know that. It's just that's just the nature of the, of the game, but – when they have bad shooting nights, and I think also the Lakers have, are able to turn it up defensively a lot better than uh, before. So, yes, I could see. I just don't think Houston can shoot consistently enough through a seven-game series the way they play basketball. I think is where the real problem comes in. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll find out as the series kicks off tomorrow, game one of the Western Conference semifinals. The Houston Rockets and L.A. Lakers will face off in game one tomorrow. Game one tonight of the Western Conference semifinals was the Denver Nuggets, who had a great seven-game series against the Utah Jazz. They faced off against the L.A. Clippers. And as it was tied after one, the Clippers pulled away after that, and they won easily tonight. Kawhi Leonard uh, was on it. Pat Beverly had his first game back in the playoff bubble, and he played very well tonight. And the Clippers were too much for Denver tonight, Spence, uh, as they're going to pretty much focus on locking down Jamal Murray. They're going to let Nikola Jokic get his. Um, but the Clippers were too much tonight. I do think that they'll be able to get a couple games in this series. Uh, but if they're going to get one, it's going to have to be in game two, as tonight the Clippers had their way and, and they rolled Denver tonight. Yeah, I was pretty actually surprised about uh, tonight uh, because – the two weakest positions guarding wise it, it point guard and center for the Clippers. That's the worst defensive place they can go. And Jamal Murray ultimately just wasn't able to do it tonight. Jokic was kind of feeding, although I think they need to feed him more. And I was just also shocked at how poorly the Nuggets played defense. Although I guess the best way to describe it is inconsistent. I think the Clippers got this weird moniker of being this tough defensive team. I don't expect that to go throughout the full playoffs. We saw what can open up, especially against a team like Dallas, who isn't as good as the Nuggets. So playoff games just happen like this is what I kind of go down to. If they were if they were to sweep them, I would be absolutely shocked. Game three of the Eastern Conference semifinals was tonight, the game before Clippers-Denver. The Boston Celtics were looking to close the door on the Toronto Raptors and take a commanding 3-0 lead in that series. Uh, but a change of plans at the end, by the Raptors as they were down 103-101 with about five seconds left. Kyle Lowry threw an inbound pass cross court to OG Ananobi. Ananobi fired the ball up quick with no time left, drained a three-point shot, and the Raptors win by one, and their playoff lives are extended as they were looking to be on life support if they were to fall down 3 nothing. Big shot by Ananobi, and the Raptors have some huge momentum heading into game four as they catch a game here and now we're down in that series two games to one. What a big win for Toronto tonight, Spence. It's actually one of the craziest things if you really think about it in the entire playoffs because the difference between a 3-0 and a 1-2 series is, I mean, you can't make it any more different than that. It's it's over at that point. And it looked like Toronto was kind of falling apart late, but you have this crazy little streak by Fred Van Fleet that ultimately led to this. I think the most interesting thing uh, about the last play is it looked – extremely similar to the Thunder Rocket last play, the very last play, not the block, because you saw the opposite side corner was open because Jalen was sleeping. It kind of felt like the same thing. So <laughs> to talk bad, I guess, about Shea Gilgus Alexander for a second for that horrible pass, he had to Steven Adams at the top of the key. So ultimately it comes through. Nick Nurse is just that good of a coach to draw up a play like that. And that was probably by design to have that open corner three. Uh, my man, Corey Fulton, Fulton is, uh, he's screaming for some Oklahoma City love here. Uh, Corey, I don't know what you want to know about Lugens Dort. He shot 12 threes in game seven. He hit six of them. Uh, he was, he had his best game of the series with 30 points. 
Um, but it didn't matter because he got his shot blocked at the end. So it was all for naught as Chris Paul and the Oklahoma City Thunder got sent packing. Uh, Steven Adams, great rim protector. Um, but what can you do? I mean, they just didn't, ha- they couldn't quite get over the hump. So Dort wasn't enough, although he led the team in three point attempts in game seven. He was uh, non existent and pretty much left open the entire series for three. He had his best game, but wasn't enough in game seven as James Harden decided he was going to have his best defensive moment of his career as yes. he blocked that shot. Uh, of Dort, three-point attempt at the buzzer, and Houston moved on, and we'll see how they fare tomorrow in game one against the Lakers. And for some of the people out there, yes, we did not get to it last week, but um, over this past week, we had some sad news in the sporting world as we've lost a lot of great legends. Uh, Former Mets Hall of Fame pitcher Tom Seaver passed away. Um, Great Georgetown historic coach John Thompson, he also passed away. Arizona college basketball coach, legendary Lute Olsen passed away. And of course, the great actor of the Black Panther and 42, the Jackie Robinson story. Um, His name, why is his name slipping my mind? Uh, Oh, Chadwick (laughs) Boseman, sorry. Chadwick Boseman, that's right. Chadwick Boseman also passed away. So our condolences to those guys. And uh, I know we've had some mentions in the comments about what about Tom Seaver? What about John Thompson? So yes. Uh, it, w- it was a sad week, and 2020 has just been relentless and, and taking lives left and right and just leaving us uh, kind of with our arms up in the air and saying what's next. So the old cliche, one day at a time, is literally how we're living in this day and time. But uh, back to uh, the NBA and the playoffs. Big news, in case you missed it, big news in the coaching world that kind of took a lot of us by surprise. The Brooklyn Nets, Spence, Corey, Brian Bravo, Tominator. The Brooklyn Nets hired former NBA MVP Steve Nash as their next head coach. And it was a surprise to a lot of people. And one of the people that surprised who had some strong comments on ESPN's first take this morning was the ever controversial Stephen A. Smith. Spence? But this ain't about him, what I'm about to say. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no way around this. This is white privilege. <laughs> I guess we can probably start there, huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, look, Stephen A. Smith, he's he's hot taking. He's off base, clearly. Derek Fisher, uh, African-American, was hired with no coaching experience. I believe Jason Kidd, former Milwaukee Bucks coach, uh, he was hired without any coaching experience. So, Steve Nash, who has worked with a lot of guys privately and his basketball IQ is clearly off the charts. I don't think this had anything to do with white privilege. I think KD and Kyrie signed off on this. I don't think they're going to walk over former MVP Steve Nash like they would a Kenny Atkinson or somebody else. But Stephen A. Smith said, this is white privilege. Spence, your thoughts. Yeah, and uh, we'll, we'll play in a second, but he kind of like conjoins these two arguments. So I just wanted to establish that this is his argument, that, that the reason he was hired was because he was white and the people who should have gotten the job were ignored. That's the reason why. So we can continue uh, in just one second here. This does not happen for a black man. No experience whatsoever on any level as a coach. And you get the Brooklyn Nets job. I know that Kyrie and KD have both signed off on this. I know they both support this move. But I'm thinking about a champion that is Ty Lue, passed up. I'm thinking about a guy who built the foundation for the Golden State Warriors in Mark Jackson, passed up. I'm thinking about the years that Sam Cassell has served as an assistant, first in the nation's capital in D.C., and now with the Los Angeles Clippers, passed up. And... Yeah, so Spence, you thought this was an awful hire, and so does Corey Fulton on Facebook. Spence, let's be honest. Tell us how you feel. You didn't think this was a good hire by Brooklyn. Yeah, so to do to do uh, deeper into this, the the reason that I say he conjoins his argument is he says they were re- he was hired because of white privilege. I don't agree with that. He was hired because he's really good friends with KD. Now, you can separate that. To me, this is a terrible hiring. You're looking for a team to go to the finals next year. Like Their contention, their team is just that good. You got two you know, MVP caliber players. You got Karis LeVert, Jared Allen, Joe Harris. You know, the, the list goes on. Spencer Dinwiddie, I didn't even mention him. 
So you're going to want to, to me, you would want to coach with a lot of experience. And that's Ty Lue and Nate McMillan. I don't even think he mentioned his name. I think he would be an incredible coach, an overachiever, uh, you know, with the, um, with the Pacers, excuse me, and he, give him a roster that is championship worthy. That would be an incredible opportunity for him. So uh, I just think at the end of the day, it's just something you shouldn't have done. Uh, I disagree. And will I say this is a risky hire? Yes, I'll say it's a risky hire, but there's too many unknowns to say that this is a bad hire or that he's not a good coach or we don't know what he's capable of doing because that's not yet to be determined. We don't know. There's a lot of psychology. There's a, a staff that he's going to put around him that we don't know what that looks like yet. So there's a lot of variables that we can't comment on that are unknown yet. So just go out and say that this is a bad hire or this may not work out. We don't know that yet. We have to see who he surrounds himself with. We've got to see uh, the psychological aspect, how he's able to, to rein in these personalities uh, and there's some interesting personalities, the flat earther, Kyrie Irving, and uh, Mr. Burner account, Kevin Durant. Okay, Mr. Sensitivity. So I believe Steve Nash, under his outside persona, does have an alpha personality. And I don't think these guys are going to walk all over him. Uh, I think it's going to be a good hire. And I think the same way that in the NFL, the San Francisco 49ers, the media questioned, why are we hiring John Lynch? as a general manager. He's got no experience as a general manager. This is a bad hire, white privilege. Well, what has John Lynch done for the San Francisco 49ers? He hired, hired Kyle Shanahan, and Kyle Shanahan put a team around the 49ers that just represented the NFC in the Super Bowl, killed the draft this year, and are looking to go back to the Super Bowl for the NFC. So before everybody jumps on and claims white privilege or this is a bad hire, let's just pump the brakes a little bit because Steve Nass – Nash has the pedigree, the basketball pedigree to succeed. He comes from Santa Clara. He's got a lot of connections. I believe he's going to put a great staff around him, and I think he's going to be highly successful. And I don't think it's going to be him that's going to be the shortcoming of the Brooklyn Nets, whether they make the finals or the playoffs. I think it's going to be the two jabronis, Kyrie Irving or Kevin Durant, because look at the Celtics. They're doing perfectly fine up to this point without Kyrie Irving. And I don't think they're going to do uh, – I think Kyrie Irving could be the detriment of the Brooklyn Nets because he's going to take away touches from Karis LeVert. We're going to see how that dynamic works with Kevin Durant. And, look, Kyrie is not known to be the greatest defender that we've seen. So, I mean, it's yet to be determined. I think – Steve, I agree with Dave. Dave Perry checks in. I think Nash is going to be a good coach. I think he's going to be a good coach for many years to come. Uh, because I think his basketball acumen is next level, as good as anybody that's in the NBA currently. And I think his psych psychological aspect that is really an unknown, I think he's going to excel at. So uh, I, I think he's going to be fine. I think the problem is going to be Irving for the most part. I, I don't think he's a good fit anywhere until he's able to change what he's going to what he's capable of doing on the court. I think he needs to be – look, James Harden is actually taking the role – of distributor pretty well. And I don't think Kyrie has done that as much. And I think he needs to do that a little more as opposed to being so ball dominant. He's got to get everybody else involved because that's going to elevate their game, not only on the offensive, but the defensive end is where they're going to need the most help. And when you're not getting guys involved offensively and you're dominating the entirety of the possessions, guys aren't going to give you maximum effort on defense. It's just a fact. So uh, I think there's a big question mark for the Nets coming into the season, but I think Nash is going to be a good fit. And I think Kyrie Irving is the X factor. Number one, is he going to be able to stay on the court because he's always hurt? And when he is on the court, how is he going to mix in the dynamic with KD and Levert? And Levert is, is an emerging star as far as I'm concerned. And uh, Spencer Dinwiddie, you mentioned him. And not only Joe Harris. Joe Harris is somebody they want to resign. There is potential on that Brooklyn team to be amazing. When you have a, if you have a drive and kick like Kyrie Irving and you're going to have Kevin Durant swinging the ball to Joe Harris, to Karis LeVert, I mean, the Nets have the potential to be outstanding. They're going to be deep. Uh, they're going to have a rim protector in Jared Allen. They've got all the pieces. We haven't even talked about DeAndre Jordan, another rim protector who didn't play in this playoff bubble. So, uh, look, Corey says Becky Hammond. I'm with you there. But look, I think, I think Steve Nash is going to do a fine job. Uh, I, I, and we'll see, we'll see how, it, how it works out. Um, uh, and, and like I said, I think if anybody is going to be the detriment of that Brooklyn Nets team, it's going to be Kyrie Irving. 
Yeah, no, I agree with you too. And in that sense, I really do agree with you that Nash was a good hiring because I think Kyrie has an immense amount of respect for Nash and I don't think he'll do some weird stuff. Like a weird story I can tell you about Kyrie Irving that was reported upon. He went into a Boston Celtics practice one time, looked, uh, you know, the coach right in the eyes and says, what does government mean to you when they're about to study film tape on the game and get ready for the game? So his mind's not always there, but I think Nash will be able to kind of rope him in. And is he overrated? No, I, I actually really don't think so uh, at all. So I think that's a little, that's saying a little much. Yes, he has his stretches, but he is one of the greatest scorers, you know, of all time, in my opinion, or has the, um, you know, he has the chance to be without a doubt, uh, the best player on a championship team, or at least extremely close to it. You know, <laughs> that shot he hit, was unbelievable in the final. So we know he has the chance to make these big plays. And we've seen that twice from Kevin Durant, who won two finals MVPs, obviously. So the real question will be, will Steve Nash be able to coach them to the level of Nick Nurse to, uh, you know, Brad Stevens? Because those are who he's going to be facing in the playoffs, you know, at least one of them, at least once, assuming. So, you know... I, I am a fan of the Nets, but I could see it falling apart pretty quickly, to be honest with you. If players don't get along and all that kind of stuff, I think it could uh, be a problem. Well, it's yet to be determined. It's definitely the big, biggest news in the NBA today, uh, the hiring of Steve Nash as the new head basketball coach of the Brooklyn Nets. And ESPN Stephen A. Smith came out, and he's adamant that that's white privilege. So um, I don't believe that's the case. We'll see. That's yet to be determined. Um, I think it's a ridiculous take. We mentioned Derek Fisher, Jason Kidd, all African-American former NBA head coaches who got hired without any previous experience. Yes, Magic Johnson was a coach, but he had no experience as a GM before the Lakers brought him in. And look, I know it's only one instance, but in the NFL, John Lynch had zero experience in any coaching or front office capacity came into San Francisco, hired Kyle Shanahan, and it's been all uphill for them. So speaking of the San Francisco 49ers and the NFL, some NFL news hit today as the Tampa Bay Bucks position themselves to be even more dangerous with the addition of this offseason of Tom Brady. Rob Gronkowski came out of retirement and joined the tight end tandem of him and O.J. Howard alongside the receiving core of Godwin and Mike Evans. Tom Brady got another weapon today along uh, with uh, Ronald Jones. Leonard Fournette, former Jaguars first-round pick running back, adds to the stable of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Does that mean former Eagles running back LaShawn McCoy could be the odd man out in the Tampa Bay backfield? But Tampa Bay just continues to look stronger as they added Leonard Fournette today. Some big news for the Bucs. No, without I think this actually moves the needle quite a bit for me. I know Fournette has a lot of problems, but you would think that Tom Brady would have enough of an influence since he works with him so personally to hone, hone him in at least for one season or two seasons until his contract's up so he can retire. But on paper, I, how can you argue? This is like a Madden team that you make on franchise mode where you pick up all the best free agents at the end of the season or whatever. So it, it comes down to whether or not he's a noodle arm or not. But again, he didn't have a lot of weapons last year. That's this your year. nickname for him, right, Spence? You think noodle arm Brady. Arm. Yeah, okay. that's what well, I, call well, I disagree. I think Tampa Bay is going to the Super Bowl for the NFC. So write it down in your books right now that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers will be representing the NFC in the Super Bowl. Uh, Corey Fulton on Facebook is trying to break breaking news here, telling us that Alvin Kamara is going to Green Bay. Uh, that is false. Uh, I don't have to read any any insight on that. I can tell you that that's fake news. Okay, so Corey, just go ahead and, and put down your mouse in your iPhone right now. Uh, Alvin Kamara is not going anywhere, especially to Green Bay, unless Green Bay plans on uh, training Aaron Rodgers, which why would why would New Orleans trade for Aaron Rodgers when they have Jameis Winston as a backup, Andrew Brees? So just put down your phone. Alvin Kamara is not going anywhere. Uh, Corey is also saying that the Knights lost a rough game here in Las Vegas. The Golden Knights have a 3-2 to two advantage on the Vancouver Canucks, and it looks like they lost 4 nothing here in uh, – uh, Game six, which is which is big. So could the Golden Knights here in Las Vegas, can they blow a 3-1 series lead as it's going to be a game seven? Uh, the Golden Knights against the Canucks. And do we see Mark andre Fleury in goal for game seven for the Golden Knights? 
Yeah, I think the real problem, <laughs> I, I'll put this on every public platform I can. I think Max Pacioretty has like the worst. I think he's the Russell Westbrook in terms of shot selection in the NHL, and I think it totally kills the team. <laughs> Statistically speaking, they shoot more shots and score less goals when he's in the lineup. I have tons of stats. You can, you can see it on my Twitter page. For some reason, I've, I've become like the uh, spokesperson for not liking Max Pacioretty. Uh, they just struggle to score goals. He, he always leads the team in shots on goal when he's in, and today they scored zero. All right, guys, can we calm down over here? Corey, I, look, Alvin Kamara is not going anywhere. Maybe you can trade for him in your fantasy league, Aaron Jones for Alvin Kamara. And maybe in your Madden franchise league, you have the Packers and you've drafted Alvin Kamara. That's the only way he's leaving the Saints is if it's fantasy football. And Dave, yes, it, it's pretty funny. The only way Brady goes to the Super Bowl is if he goes with Giselle. Uh, I think you're wrong. I think it'll be San Francisco and Tampa Bay in the NFC Championship game. And look, Brady's got the pedigree and he's got all the weapons. Uh, he's never had uh, offensive first head coach in Bruce Arians. He's been working with these guys all offseason. He's got more weapons than he's ever had. And the Bucs are going to be good. And don't forget, they've got some some players on defense too. Levante David, uh, they drafted an offensive lineman. that uh, They're going to be good. They're going to be very good. Um, and it's a tough division. Look, they've, they've got to play the likes of New Orleans, the LA Rams, uh, San Francisco. It's a very tough division, uh, but it's an NFC with an expanded playoff this year. Remember, guys, you're going to have an extra wild card team in both conferences this year. So there could be three three teams uh, from that NFC South that could be making the playoffs. And I think there's a good possibility that that happens. And I think the Bucs are going to be in prime position, especially with no home field advantage for any of these teams, to make a, a run at the Super Bowl. I think they're putting all the uh, pieces together, and I think it'll be tough. Um, yes, he's never played out of a Belichick system, but this is Tom Brady we're talking about, okay? This is a guy that was a buck 75 coming out of the NFL draft combine. Nobody expected him to do anything, and he got on the field and has worked his way – into being a successful quarterback into his 40s. So you want to bet against Tom Brady, be my guest. I will not do that. Uh, I think this is the most stacked team he's had his entire career, and I think he's going to take advantage of it in the NFC. And we've seen uh, teams like the Saints that uh, I wouldn't say choked, but they laid an egg at home in the playoffs this past year against the Vikings. They let Kirk Cousins beat them. Um, Saints new team. What does that say? Saints new team of all two years. Stop. Oh, after you go. <laughs> <laughs> Corey, this trade is not happening. It may be happening in your fantasy team, but I don't know where, where you're getting your sources from, but please post them. Uh, but that's not happening. The Saints aren't trading Kamara, and I don't know what Green Bay thinks they could give up to get him unless they want to trade uh, multiple first-round picks for the rest of their career. It may be a good trade if they could get him, but uh, we've never seen the Packers make any type of crazy trade like that. They're not known to do that. Uh, Brian Bravo, a big Cowboys fan, is hoping that his Cowboys reach the Super Bowl against the Chiefs. Uh, the Cowboys, they'll make the playoffs this year. Uh, we'll, we'll see how, how they do with Mike McCarthy at the helm as the new head coach. Um, I like Doc, Dak Prescott. Um, look, San Diego is no more. So I don't know, what, Vic, what do you what do you want to say about San Diego? Uh, no, it's they're, never, they're never stacked. When have they been stacked? Okay. No, that year they went. Uh, oh, that one year, games. ten years ago. Come on, get with the times. Okay, San Diego is not in San Diego anymore. And the last time they were stacked, Philip Rivers had two kids instead of ten. Okay, so that was at least a decade ago. Um, the Cowboys look. They they've got a shot this year. Uh, they've got a, a division that's very winnable with the Eagles. Look, the Eagles are filled with injuries, um, and. You definitely don't expect uh, definitely don't expect the Giants under first year head coach Joe Judge or the Redskins to win that division. So um, I, th I think the Cowboys will win that division and they'll have an opportunity to make some noise in the playoffs. But without there being fans for the most part this year, um, you know, there's not going to be any home home field advantage. So it's really going to be up in the air. It doesn't. It's not going to matter the seeding this year. It's not going to matter if you're the. This is going to be a special year where it doesn't matter if you're the first seed or you're the seventh seed. As far as travel goes, that's one thing. But as far as home field advantage, there's not going to be much of it. So um, the Tominator, I, I know you, you want your Jets to be alive, but they have an awful head coach. Adam Gase is terrible. This is going to be his last year as the head coach of the Jets. Their only saving grace is they've got a quarterback of the future in Sam Darnold. Um, but their head coach stinks, and their running back uh, made a big mistake by not playing 
the year he sat out with the Steelers and has pretty much uh, lost all his luster. So, look, guys, I appreciate all the comments. I appreciate everyone tuning in. We are live every Tuesday and Thursday here in Las Vegas for the rest stop from 9 to 10 o'clock Pacific time here in Las Vegas. And if you go to www.twitch.tv slash Chris Landry football, and you can see us live every Tuesday and Thursday. And of course, we'll broadcast live on Facebook and Twitch. And if you miss any part of the show, you can go to any of the podcast platforms and search Landry football conference call. And then you'll see the rest up underneath there. Make sure you give us the click and listen for Dave, Victor, Brian, Bravo, Corey. Guys, thanks for coming in tonight. Get your Twitch app for free click the twitch app give us comments on the twitch app and subscribe uh to Landry football conference call we'll be back on tuesday live nine o'clock this is the rest stop thanks to spencer the wiz i'm brad rest of the two of you guys have a great night enjoy your weekend we'll see you on tuesday